America's founding is tainted with the stain of slavery. This is undoubtedly among the darkest parts of American history that has long been repudiated. It also presents a paradox. The founding principles of liberty and equality are incompatible with the institution of slavery that was still present upon the founding. This has left a void ready to be filled with all kinds of interpretations as to what America is fundamentally about. Slavery would be foundational to the economy, politics, and laws of the new nation. There are historians who research the past in order to understand the nuanced truth, and then there are those who are focused on rewriting history in order to further their ideological and political agenda in the modern day. All these anachronistic claims that are all meant to take economic institutions that exist today and taint them with the uh, insidious legacy of slavery, which is very real, a very horrific institution, but they're using them to paint economic institutions in the present day with that brush. And the purpose is not to investigate the history of slavery, it's to uh, basically call for a radical overthrow of, of basic capitalistic institutions of our economy. Philip Magnus is one of the most passionate, significant, and qualified critics of the New York Times 1619 Project, which just launched a Hulu miniseries. This is the 1619 Project. As a historian who specializes in 19th century United States, the American Revolution, and the political and economic dimensions of slavery, he was astonished at the core fallacies, distortions, and omissions of the 1619 Project, and exposes the underlying Marxist ideology that underpins the 1619 Project's premises, when ironically, it's slavery and Marxism that have much more in common than the 1619 Project's authors care to admit. What I really wanted to ask him first was, is tipping rooted in slavery and racism? Well, that's apparently the claim that's coming out of some sectors of academia and really the activist corners of the internet right now. Uh, but as a historical point, uh, I found no evidence of it whatsoever. In fact, we have records of tipping, or it was referred to as a gratuity, mm -hmm. uh, going all the way back to the Middle Ages. It's just a recurring practice. Uh, it's even mentioned in Shakespeare's The Tempest and several other plays and literature at that time all through the 19th century before the United States abolished slavery. So the notion that, uh, that tipping comes out of the aftermath of slavery is just anachronistic. So where did this idea come from? So a few years ago, and this, this is as best as I could tell, there was a book that was published called Forked, and it was written by a minimum wage activist, uh, Saru ja Jamarayan, I believe is her yes, name. Yes, yes. And uh, it made the claim on a really flimsy interpretation of the evidence that in the aftermath of slavery in the United States, it's abolished in 1865, that tipping becomes a customary practice to underpay African Americans uh, rather than uh, giving them a full living wage. And this is coming from the perspective of someone who is like a full-time minimum wage activist. Uh, she does not like tipping because service industry workers often get a wage below the legal minimum wage with the idea being that the tip vastly overcompensates relative if, if we were to equalize wages at the minimum wage. Yeah. So a typical server uh, may be operating in a place where the minimum wage is 12 or $15 an hour, but is pulling in 25 or $30 an hour because they're a good server and they're getting tipped. So it looks like this author, she might have an agenda. That's absolutely the case. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm reading this book and her evidence is extremely flimsy. It comes down to basically just like a, a uh, an offhanded... Uh, observation about the uh, 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 railroad uh, porters at the turn of the century, uh, which was a, a industry that employed a lot of African Americans. And uh, there were various anti-tipping movements that emerged in the early 20th century, late 19th century U.S., ah. uh, mostly because they saw it as a European custom that was being carried over into the U.S. Okay. But uh, in some areas, race got wrapped up in that, and she just infers from that that this is a an exploitative system that's devised in the aftermath of slavery. Uh, but she also contradicts her own evidence because she documents instances where individual states actually banned tipping for periods of their history. Yeah. And they're all states like Mississippi and South Carolina and Tennessee, states of the old Confederacy that supposedly uh, are enacting tipping 
uh, or, or supposedly using tipping as this racist institution to perpetuate slavery, but in reality, these are the exact states that are banning the practice, so the, the evidence doesn't even align. Banning the practice of slavery. Well, banning the practice, practice of tipping. Ah. They, they actually prohibited tipping in the early 20th century in several of these deep south states that, at the peak of their Jim Crow era as well. Oh, okay, okay, I see, I yeah. see. So, so it actually is contradictory. As is often with a lot of these things. Exactly. Right? And, and, and for, but for whatever reason, this book gets picked up and now is cited as authoritative proof that tipping is rooted in the aftermath of slavery. So after it's published, uh, several of the self-appointed fact checkers, I know we've talked about mm-hmm. those before, uh, which are often uh, you know, like a, a 20-something with a journalism or a poetry degree purporting to weigh in on matters of expertise on behalf of major media outlets. Mm-hmm. Well, they write uh, fact checks on the claim that tipping is racist, and they all cite the same book even though the book itself is built on a really flimsy uh, evidentiary basis. So that it's just kind of multiplied through the fact checker world. So bad scholarship yep. gets picked up into the echo chamber, and then suddenly it's everywhere. And as I said, with an agenda behind it. And Absolutely. so then there was somebody who picked this up and tweeted about it, right? Right, Nicole right. Nicole Hannah-Jones. Right. So we fast forward to last year, Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, in her publicity campaign for the 1619 Project, the premise of which is that racism and slavery are at the core of everything. Uh, you know, the original 1619 Project book, uh, or the volume that was released out of the New York Times, the magazine, they claim that Microsoft Excel is derivative of slavery. Yes. And this proves that it's racist. Because uh, of accounting practices. Because of accounting practices. Which actually date back to... Medieval Italy. <laughs> so all these anach- anachronistic claims that are all meant to take economic institutions that exist today and taint them with the uh, insidious legacy of slavery, which is very real, a very horrific institution, but they're using them to paint economic institutions in the present day with that brush And the purpose is not to investigate the history of slavery. It's to uh, basically call for a radical overthrow of of basic capitalistic institutions of our economy. And tipping's one of them. So what does Nicole Hannah-Jones do? She tweets out this announcement that uh, tipping is fundamentally racist and links to some of these fact-checker pieces that all go back to this uh, shoddy claim in this book as if it's just gospel now. Right, right. So... The 1619 Project itself, for our audience, what is it? How did it come about? Yeah. 1619 Project started as a journalism venture of the New York Times. They launched it in August 2019, which was to match the anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved African Americans in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it starts as an an interesting historical retrospective project. And uh, I'll preface this by noting that of the original 12 or so uh, feature essays in it, uh, the majority of them are pretty unobjectionable. They're highlighting... Interesting elements of scholarship on the history of racism, history of of slavery. Some of them are cultural. They point to music. They point to art, poetry, uh, photography. So some very interesting content. Mm -hmm. But it's really the lead essay and a couple of the successive essays that try to take this content and turn it in an aggressively political direction. And the idea, as was originally framed in the... uh, the August 2019 version of the 1619 Project on the New York Times' website is that uh, they are aiming to take the year 1619 and all of its implications and legacies about slavery and make that uh, a mechanism to displace 1776 as the true founding of the United States. And then they run with it from there. They basically turn uh, this claim about slavery being the, uh, the core basis of all American history into a political call for radical economic redistribution, uh, an overturning of capitalism, Mm -hmm. uh, a seizure of uh, the resources of society. And uh, of course, the mechanism that they're going after is uh, slavery reparations, but it's even more fundamental than that. Uh, They view capitalism as tainted by slavery and fundamentally unjust, unfair, and in need of some sort of a, a radical and even revolutionary overthrow. 
So um, in your book, The 1619 Project, A Critique, you go into great detail about all of these arguments. Uh, you offer your counter arguments. You also say, hey, there are certain points that I might agree with or that might be Absolutely. difficult to contest. One of the things that you speak about in your book is the new history of capitalism. Yeah. Okay. And this is a school of thought. Yes. Uh, that is being used in the 1619 Project to support their arguments. So can you tell me what that is exactly, yeah. the new history of capitalism? Yeah. So within the history profession, people have been studying slavery since the time slavery existed. Uh, it is one of the most written about subjects in mm. all of American history. Every substantive history of the American Civil War addresses slavery. And for the past century and a half, uh, it's just been a recurring theme of the history profession. Uh, in fact, there's a, um, a bit of a revolution in intellectual thought about slavery that occurred starting with economists in the late 1950s. Mm. Uh, there was a, uh, a pair of economists that uh, uh, basically invented what is now referred to as the field of cleometrics. Yes. That's taking data to interpret the past. And uh, what they did is they put together uh, some records from plantations and tried to test the question, is slavery still profitable on the eve of the American Civil War? Uh, and this is uh, Conrad and Meyer in the Journal of Political Economy, I think it came out in 1958 or 59, mm -hmm. landmark paper. And, and they find, yes, it is. Uh, so they start asking the questions, what are the economic institutions of slavery? And then for the, the, the half century that followed, this has been a dominant theme of the uh, academic work. But in the early 2010s, a small group of historians, mostly younger historians that were at elite institutions mm -hmm. like Harvard and Cornell and uh, uh, Brown, Princeton, places like that, mm -hmm. uh, basically announced that in the wake of the financial crises of uh, 2008, 2009, uh, that they are reinvestigating the history of capitalism. And that's an interesting time to do it. Yes. <laughs> when I read that, I thought that that's a really interesting time to write the new history of capitalism. Right. It's a very presentist political moment to do it. Right. And, and they're all about that. And the gist of it is that so they, uh, they publish a series of books in the early 2010s. Uh, the major figures are Sven Beckert at Harvard. Um, it's uh, Edward E. Baptist at mm -hmm. uh, Cornell, and he probably writes the book that's the single most prominent book associated. It's called The Half Has Never Been Told. Yes. And you see there that they're touting their own novelty. They name themselves the new history of capitalism, and that the implicit and sometimes explicit message that they're carrying here is that historians have not properly investigated the economics of slavery until now, until us, and we're here to show you the way. And I, I remember when this first burst onto the scene, I'm reading it, and I, I was already a published historian of the economics of slavery. And I thought, this is an utterly nonsensical claim that disregards the previous 50 years of academic literature. And it turns out that there are two reasons they do that. One is they are generally, uh, I, I'd even go so far as to say, intellectually illiterate of that previous literature. Mm, uh, they haven't read it. They haven't read it. They don't know its major claims. They use caricatures that uh, uh, Ed Baptist in particular uh, says that, well, economists think about slavery, and he, he, he references this throwback theory to like the early 1900s that's been discredited among almost all economists since the 1950s. Uh, so he hasn't read it. And then on top of that, the, uh, the newness of it is a reorientation of the scholarly project away from understanding the economic mechanisms of what made a slave economy function and into this larger narrative that asserts that slavery and capitalism are wedded at the hip, therefore capitalism and all the injustices that they claim and see today, inequality, climate change, you name it, are supposedly genealogically descendants of the slave system that has forever tainted American capitalism. And they use that as the launching pad to uh, go into demands for political reform in 2020 or 2023. Right. So they're clearly, they, again, there's an agenda mm -hmm. and they're using their own interpretation of numbers and facts um, and sometimes distortions or misrepresentations of those things uh, in order to advance their missions, it seems. Um, and, and, one thing that really stuck out to me, too, was that one of these scholars, I guess, that they refer to, Fitzhugh? Yes, George Fitzhugh, yeah. Can you tell us about him? And and because he was an interesting guy. Yeah. Um, he is pro-slavery, 
but the the new history of capitalism people are using him as an argument against slavery right so there there's a this is how out of touch they are with the intellectual history uh, so george fitzhugh is a slave owner in the, he's active mostly in the 1850s United States, and he, he comes to prominence as probably the main counter-argument against the abolitionist movement that the slave owners put up. Uh, he writes a series of books, and he's a magazine writer as well. For Okay, uh, so he wasn't a historian. He no, was a no, he, he's writer. an actual Sorry. practitioner, a My theorist. Area. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, and an owner of slaves himself, yeah. and is a he, he views slavery as the superior economic system, the one to produce... Uh, uh, more and do so in an ordered way. He views uh, enslaved people as inferior, and they need uh, structure placed in their life by the uh, the ruling class. Yeah. So it's a really retrograde theory, although he mixes it with proto Marxism. Yes. Which is the fascinating thing. Yes. He discovers a theory of surplus value almost a decade before Karl Marx does, and he runs with it. So he's talking about wage exploitation in the factories of the North. And he basically comes to the conclusion, he says, the most perfect system of socialism that could ever exist is the socialism we have on the slave plantations. So he views this plantation itself as a microcosm socialistic society. And this guy is, uh, you know, he, he attains fame in the, in the decade before the Civil War, both as a radical slavery advocate, but as, as the counterpart to argue against Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and all the prominent abolitionists that are saying, no, slavery is wrong. Yeah. And what's fascinating here is the new historians of capitalism, they completely misconstrue and or omit Fitzhugh as the intellectual history. Because Fitzhugh, not only when he's making this argument in favor of, of plantations as the, the socialistic utopia, mm-hmm. uh, he declares his enemies in the world. And it's not the abolitionist he targets first, although I guess in a sense it is. He targets free market economists. Right. He says, the works of Adam Smith and Jean-Baptiste Say must be cast into the fire because free market economics, free market political economy, or what we refer to today at capitalism, is, Mm -hmm. quote, at war with all types of slavery everywhere. So you have the new historians of capitalism say slavery is wedded at the hip, and the leading theorist of slavery in the 1850s is saying that capitalism and slavery are incompatible and at war. Something's not right here in the yes. history. And were they using some of his arguments? Yeah, so they, they adapt. So this is the weird thing, and this comes out of Matthew Desmond's chapter right. in the 1619 Project. He's the main writer that does the economics of mm-hmm. it, and Nicole Hannah-Jones embraces and loves this chapter because it, it fits all of her uh, progressive political goals. Right. Uh, so Desmond has this weird, I'd say even kooky theory that slavery's fault is, I mean, it's an unjust system, but he, his biggest objection to slavery is the fact that it divided the proletarian classes. It kept white laborers and black laborers into two separate classes. Therefore, their class identity and unity could not come together, and therefore they could not bring about the socialist revolution that Karl Marx predicted. Wow. Wow. So these guys have a lot in common with Marxists. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think it's it's the implicit default economic system that they adopt is some offshoot of Marxism. Now, it may not be Soviet-style communism. Right. Uh, in fact, in Desmond's case, where he picks this up, and some of the other new historians of capitalism pick this up, uh, it's not Soviet-style Marxism that they're advancing. It's a different strain of Marxism that came from the German historical school of the late 19th century. Is that the Frankfurt School? Uh, no, it's a precursor that's somewhat at odds with it. Uh, okay. So this is uh, a, a group of economists that trained in the 1870s and 80s in Germany. Uh, the leading figure of the generation that writes the most about slavery is a fellow by the name of Werner Sombart. Okay. Uh, he writes a book in the early 20th century called Der Mo- Moderna Capitalismus, and he states exactly this new history of capitalism thesis. So the new history of capitalism is not even new. It's a, <laughs> it's an old throwback to Werner Sombart in 1903. Wow. Uh, and, you know, his thesis is that, uh, well, first he states what I just told you Desmond's argument is about the, the class divide, that race had split up the, the proletarians as a, as a co- uh, cohesive interest. Then he also argues that uh, capitalism, modern American capitalism, is basically derivative of, 
of uh, the cotton industry. So he gives a monocausal uh, single industry cause of economic development in the United States. Right. And the new historians of capitalism have taken that and run with it today into uh, absurd and factually just nonsensical positions. I think that there was something in the 1619 project which said uh, that the cotton industry made up for a massive amount of the GDP, I forget right, what percentage, right. when it clearly made up only 5%, something yeah, like so, that. Yeah, so this is the Ed Baptist claim, The Half Has Never Been Told, which is the book that's used by Desmond as the structure right. for his chapter. Right, right. And what, what Baptist does is he found some economic historians that measured the growth in the cotton industry of the United States. And the, mm -hmm. uh, this is um, Alan Olmsted and, and uh, Paul Rode write this uh, fairly prominent paper, and it's a good paper, um, where they start in the year 1800 and they figure out cotton output, and they trace it through 1860, so the eve of the Civil War, and they find that cotton output of the United States grows by 400%. So it's a massive expanding industry. Then they ask the question of why. Yeah. We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. Baptist takes their statistic, imports it into his book, and fits it into this thesis that he, he basically makes up out of thin air as far as, as anyone who's read it can tell. And his thesis is that 400% growth must have come from capitalistic plantation owners figuring out how to make slave beating more efficient, to extract more labor out of them, to be more exploitative. Right, uh, and he goes. He has some anecdotal claims that are really turn out to be based on some uh, misrepresentations of evidence and putting evidence together. Exactly, putting... piecing it together, and then overlaid on top of this, he he does a uh, a very bizarre calculation. So he figures out the GDP of the United States uh, from prior to the Civil War, and that's your denominator, and then in the numerator he tries to add up the components of GDP that came from the cotton industry. Uh, now, anyone who's taken Macro 101, National Income Accounts lessons, know that uh, you only count finished goods in GDP. So uh, a, a brand new car on delivery is part of GDP. The paint that goes onto that car is not. Mm -hmm. uh, the paint is, is an intermediate process in production. And the idea here is that the finished price captures all the steps towards... Uh, yeah, so it's basic national accounting. Uh, and these are, are fixed formulas. Uh, it's the standard methodology. Uh, what Baptist does is he takes all the intermediate steps of, of cotton production and double, in some cases even triple counts them, and finally gets to the point where half of the entire U.S. economy before the Civil War is supposedly tied to cotton-produced slavery. I wonder if he used an Excel spreadsheet to do it. Well, there's, there's a question, yeah. Because if he did, he might be uh, uh, involved in racism. Uh, that's a whole other step because uh, uh, Matthew Desmond, when he makes the Excel spreadsheet, he actually transposed a line in another text. Uh, the, the other book he was relying on said, uh, we're studying, it says a book about the accounting practices of the plantation, and the author, Caitlin Rosenthal, says, I am not claiming that Excel today derives from the accounting practices yes. of the plantation. And he misread that and says, see, Excel derives from the accounting. So it's not a competent history. Uh, but, but going back to Ed Baptist, and he yeah. makes this claim, and here's where Olmsted and Rhodes' study becomes really interesting, because they investigate why 400% growth occurs. Mm -hmm. It's not because whipping on plantation, as horrible as it was and as uh, brutal of a reality as it was, became more efficient. Mm -hmm. The reality is they discovered that uh, the through the trial and error and innovative processes of several seasons of, of yielding a, a cotton crop, they figured out the strains of cottonseed that were more robust to disease, that yielded a bigger crop, uh, that could be planted in different regions of the country. So it's a, uh, it's a technological innovative process. Right. So the same plantation in 1800 uh, versus 1860. In 1860, they would have yielded more cotton because they had better technology, right. is the story. Right. And Olmsted and Rode proved this, but Baptist takes their material, their data, throws out and ignores the evidence of why and supplements his own basically made-up thesis, and then that gets moved over into the 1619 Project and presented as if it's fact. So it's back to the echo chamber. You get bad academic history, just like we saw in the tipping case, gets picked up and repeated as fact by journalism, and then stated as if uh, there's no, no contest, no challenge of this. Right. Meanwhile, the academic debate's playing out. Baptist's book gets reviewed by economic historians, 
and uh, they excoriated. It's just ripped it to pieces, including Olmstead and Road, who go back and say, you're, you're misusing our statistics. Yeah. Uh, we are calling you out for doing so. Uh, this is a junk book that probably should be uh, substantially revised or withdrawn from the publisher, at least in my mind. And this is multiple leading economic historians of slavery have found severe fundamental defects in the new history of capitalism literature. And there's no glimpse of that in the 1619 Project because that disrupts their political narrative of what they're trying to do, which is discredit capitalism. That's right. That's what I was going to say is that the 1619 Project, it seems that part of the agenda there is to pair slavery and um, American prosperity, economic prosperity uh, with capitalism. So saying that, you know, these things exist together. Therefore, in order to make some kind of moral reparations, we need to abolish capitalism. Right. Um, I think that would be one thing, right? Um, And then there's something else there as well, is that at the same time as doing this and repeating that message over and over and over, it's also, we need to rewrite American history. The exactly. founding itself was problematic. Exactly. Exactly. So they tie into this, um, the, this is the new history of capitalism literature. Sir. That's the end game, mm-hmm. is they want radical economic reforms that right. redistribute wealth. Yes. Uh, they want taxes to go up. Uh, Matthew Desmond even makes, and I'm, I'll dare say it, it is a crackpot ar- argument. He asserts that the IRS is not strong enough today because it was crippled by slavery. Uh, wow. There's no evidence for this whatsoever. In fact, I, I wrote an entire dissertation on taxation in the 19th century. One of the major findings of it is the ratification of the Income Tax Amendment, the 13th Amendment between 1909 and 1913, mm-hmm. has its strongest support in the southern states of the old Confederacy. Why? Because the previous tax system, the tariff system, benefited the, the free states of the industrial Northeast. I and see. it had been this way since the Civil War. I see. Uh, so I don't know where he's making this up from, but that's part of the goal. Uh, he wants a strong, robust IRS to redistribute wealth and, and, and basically impose uh, like a, an income tax on steroids or a wealth tax, a Thomas yeah. Piketty-style yes. redistribution. And this is supposedly to recompense for capitalism's role in slavery, and he doesn't even have the basic history right. But then they pair that to an, a, an outright attack on American constitutionalism, uh, on the principles that derive from the American Revolution. Yes. And this is where Nicole Hannah-Jones has gotten in a lot of trouble. Uh, although she, it hasn't deterred her any. Uh, so her opening essay has this really controversial line in it. She announces that the reason that the colonists went to war against Great Britain in 1776 is they perceived the British Empire as a threat to slavery. Yes, I read that in your yeah. book. And uh, explain, where well, does this come from and why is it false? I, I mean, the most generous uh, interpretation of it is that it comes from half-truths. Uh, the fact is, in the Revolutionary uh, Era, slavery cross-cut both sides of the fight. There were pro-slavery colonists. There mm-hmm. were pro-slavery British uh, military figures that even thought that their future was that we win the revolution, we'll get some land in South Carolina, and we can own a plantation. Right. Uh, right. There are anti-slavery colonists that view, through philosophical principles, the yes. revolution as being the first step in the fight against slavery. Uh, so James Otis is the famous lawyer who gives the speech that uh, announces um, uh, no taxation without representation. And this is in the aftermath of all the punitive tax measures that were imposed uh, on Massachusetts in particular. Uh, everything that led to and then followed after the Boston Tea Party. Right. Uh, so no taxation without representation. Otis is also an abolitionist. Uh, Benjamin Franklin Uh, is personally converted to abolitionism uh, through several of his friends. One of them uh, is Anthony Benizet, who's a Quaker abolitionist. Mm. And in uh, in the early 1770s, so just three years before the the revolution, there's a a famous court case that happens in London where a slave owner, uh, this is the Somerset versus Stewart case. Stewart brings his slave Somerset on board a ship to London, and a group of abolitionists realize that slavery is not legal in England proper. Mm-hmm. So they go down to the court and they file a writ of habeas corpus with the judge, and the judge reviews the laws and says, uh, there's no law that says you can hold this man against his will on your ship. 
uh, and they order Stuart to basically free his slave. Uh, so it's it's seen as a, a watershed moment in the abolition movement because it is. Yes. And Nicole Hannah Jones's interpretation is, ah, see, aha, the British were ready to abolish slavery and the colonists rebelled. Well, in fact, we have a record of Benjamin Franklin's reaction to this because he writes Anthony Benizet. So we we just saw this case coming out of England, and. Uh, uh, Franklin is upset at the case because the judge only limited it to the one slave, Somerset. He says, this is a hypocritical case because why Why are they saying we're only freeing one slave and yet right. they're continuing the, fra- the, the slave trade? So he doesn't think it goes far enough. Right. So basic evidence is contradicting Nicole Hannah-Jones' narrative here. Yes. But I think that this, Phil, is the quintessential question, though, is why was slavery able to even exist if America's founding and the founding fathers were all about liberty, they were all about rule of law, equality under the law, then why? And I think that because things happen the way that they did, you're able to see things like the new history of capitalism. You're exactly. able to exactly. see the 1619 project. So they project. take kernels of truth and then they run with it into completely ahistorical proportions. That's and right. This is over and over again. And, and what happens is you get something like the 1619 project. It basically discounts the abolition movement because from 1776 until the day slavery is abolished, mm-hmm. till uh, it's usually marked as Juneteenth, 1865. So June 19th, that's when the Emancipation Proclamation finally reaches the fur- furthest. Uh, geographic distribution of the Confederacy, and slavery is ended. Yes. Uh, now there's a they have to ratify the Thirteenth Amendment. There's a succession of, of legal uh, measures, but there, this is a drawn out battle that has already started in 1776, if not earlier, in the colonies, because there are people that, on philosophical principled grounds, view this institution as wrong, and it, it's, it's really one of the first major movements against slavery in the history of the entire world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, this is an institution that's existed since biblical times. Right. And finally, you have a philosophical framework that they're saying, no, this is a violation of rights. And we have these records. So the debate at the Constitutional Convention, there's a uh, uh, delegate from Maryland by the name of Luther Martin who stands up and he announces he's not going to sign the Constitution because it doesn't do enough to move against slavery. Now, he has to weigh that. There are practical considerations because if the northern states got their way and abolished slavery under the Constitution, then the southern states won't sign, and then they can't ratify. So it's the practical realities keep imposing themselves on the philosophical derivatives of the the Constitution. Yet at the same time, you see in the northern states, there is a clear recognition slavery is wrong and, in fact, is inconsistent with the principles of the Declaration. So Massachusetts in the early 1780s, abolishes slavery. Yes. Uh, the justice that, that rules in the case basically says, this is inconsistent with our principles. This institution can no longer exist. So the revolution itself becomes an impetus, especially in the northern states, to slowly and gradually, but through very clear means, strike against slavery. So what you have is over the next two decades after the revolution, Almost all of the northern states take measures to abolish slavery. And not only that, as the country is expanding westward, Mm -hmm. the Continental Congress prohibits slavery in the old northwestern territories. And that is Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, uh, that region of the country today. So as they enter in as, as states, they cannot have slavery. So it's barred at the federal level. And it's all because of the principles of the revolution say that uh, this is an inconsistent institution. So this makes sense, actually, because if if we can actually put ourselves back in that time where that was the norm, where mm-hmm. slavery was existing in the British colonies, right? And and prior to that in Great Britain, yeah. um, f- it would be difficult to start a brand new country exactly. and get everybody on board. And this is not in defense of slavery, no, clearly, not, not but I'm, I'm trying to empathize with what it was like for the people who wanted clearly to have no part in it and at the same time wanted to create America. Well, that, that's the whole question here. Mm. And, and what they eventually settle on for very practical reasons, they need a coalition that's able to win the war. Okay, Right. Because if Massachusetts revolts on its own, it gets crushed. It has the largest empire in the world descending on it. So they needed the southern states Mm -hmm. that were pro-slavery. Yeah, so they needed all 13 colonies, and that's an an emphasis. And they made that calculation. They said, we have to defer action on the slavery question because the more immediate matter before us is whether we survive as a country. Wow. 
And that's why you get the whole, it's more of a, uh, it's a scale, it's a gradient of opinions on slavery. It's not a clear cut on either side. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you have abolitionists that are on the revolutionary side. You have slave owners that have doubts and qualms about the future of slavery on the revolutionary side. This is George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are the prominent examples there. They they own slaves, but they know it's wrong, and they know it's not a permanent long-term thing that can sustain. But then you have some fairly radical pro-slavery figures in in the Deep South. Uh, William Lawton Smith, and I may mention that because no one ever knows or hears of this guy, uh, in the 1790s gives a very pro-slavery speech in Congress. Uh, yes. But in Nicole Hannah Jones's version, like all of America is William Lawton Smith. Right. James Otis is excluded. Benjamin Franklin's excluded. Jefferson and Washington are at best viewed as, as terrible hypocrites. And it's this very fringe, radical pro-slavery segment of the South that is elevated to the entirety of the narrative. Can we talk about, uh, there's somebody you mention in your book who was an abolitionist, who was also a businessman, mm-hmm. And who had created um, some new systems, basically for a kind of free market system. So Absolutely. he was he was an example of somebody who was capitalist in the sense, uh, not the derogatory, uh, derogatory sense of capitalism, yeah. but like yeah. a free market kind of entrepreneur who was pro abolition. And um, there's a great story there about what happened to him when he was trying to fight yeah, exactly. free slaves. So. Yeah, so this is, uh, if you, it goes into the history of American capitalism and American philanthropy. Uh, so in the 1830s, uh, the Tappan brothers, Arthur uh, and Louis Tappan of New York City, uh, they are both very religious uh, individuals who have personal moral qualms with slavery. Uh, they're also wealthy merchants. They, they own one of the main dry goods uh, provisioners in New York City uh, that has distribution networks all over the country. Uh, so quintessential American success story capitalism based in New York City, but they're personally objecting to slavery. Uh, so they realize that they're millionaires, or, or I guess whatever the equivalent would have been in that era. Right. And they said, we can use our fortune to fight this insidious institution. So they're the financiers that help William Lloyd Garrison set up his newspaper. Uh, they're the financiers that are, are, are giving donations to all these abolition societies to put pressure on the South to end this institution. And what happens in the late 1830s is they start getting demonized as the evil capitalist entrepreneurs who are fighting slavery. I mean, uh, you see some of this today in the way that we that the left talks about the Koch brothers or the left talks about uh, uh, the supposed dark money of the millionaires. Well, the Tappan brothers are the dark money that's funding right. the abolition movement. Right. Uh, so in the late 1830s, there's even a moment when in, in South Carolina, um, uh, some local slave owners put a bounty on the head of the Tappan brothers and said, uh, uh, if you go murder this guy and bring his body down to Charleston, we'll give you $20,000. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's horrific. It's like legally calling for the sanction of murder, and they're doing it in a point in history when no one in South Carolina is willing to enforce against that right. because it, they view it as part of the war to preserve slavery. So why doesn't a story like that make it into the 1619 Project, Phil? So it doesn't fit their narrative. And the Tappan brothers are, are uh, uh, you know, part of the success story is they actually faced physical threats to their well-being because they backed the anti-slavery movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the, the bounty doesn't work, uh, the slave owners switch their strategy. They say, well, these, these guys are, are running a, a nationwide uh, mercantile business. Uh, why don't we start intentionally defrauding them? And we'll put in orders and we'll never pay for them or we'll, uh, we'll fabricate our bills uh, and and solicit things out of their farms, and we'll put them out of business. Is, is what they yeah. Thought. So these greedy capitalists yeah. basically almost went bankrupt from because this whole smear campaign and from a, all of these threats, exactly right? It. But they managed to yeah. be entrepreneurial and they rose from the ashes. So what did they do to kind of uh, to regrow their wealth and and to regrow their business and to actually uh, further advance their uh, their philosophical yeah. causes. Yeah, so, so Lewis Tappan in particular, he, see, he sees that there, there's a problem. Uh, he sees their firm is being defrauded and it's been driven to the verge of bankruptcy, basically by an attack from the slave owners. Uh, so what he d- he devises an interesting thing. He says, well, why don't we set up a private institution because the public sector is not obviously not enforcing our contracts. It's obviously not um, 
fulfilling the role that why we expect government to exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, says so let, let's set up a private network. What we will do is we'll station agents of credit in all of the major port cities of the United States that work for us, and we'll offer a subscription service to all the mercantile businesses in New York City that if you subscribe, you hire this agent. This agent's job is to be the man on the ground that figures out if this is a reputable order, if this is a reputable line of credit, or is this person going to defraud you. Right. And through that private information network, they send notices back to New York City uh, of whether this contract should proceed as planned or whether this is a scam. Uh, and, and basically what it does is it, it's the the origin point of credit in the United States. Uh, personal credit we all have on our, uh, when we take out loans and credit cards, we have a credit score. Yeah. Uh, businesses all have credit ratings and there are private entities, agencies that are mostly done on a subscription basis that evaluate their books and make sure that they're solvent. Uh, and that's all, or, the origin point is basically this innovation to fight the slave owners. That's so cool. That's I, I. That's something that I didn't know before, and I think that's a really interesting piece there. If you look at a neighboring country like Canada, mm-hmm. okay, you say, well, well, Canada never had a slavery problem, right? Um, but that's just a simple answer, right? I mean, it absolutely, is. it's a simple answer. I'm sure you have a good answer to that question. I have a yeah. few ideas, but I'd like to hear what you think. What well, What all comes from institutional and legal history? Uh, the fact that slavery ar- arrived in the southern colonies. And it's 1619 is the date that the first ship arrives, but their legal status is kind of ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it was a Dutch trading ship that uh, unloaded uh, slaves from Africa. And Jamestown, Virginia, their, their legal system didn't really know what to deal with it. it was, uh, the question is, do we treat these as indentured servants, just like the boat that arrived from England? Or do we treat these as a different category? Uh, mm-hmm. That really isn't settled until the 1660s. Uh, and what happens is that there uh, are descendants of the first groups of slaves that now have questions about their legal status. If, if you're a descendant, uh, are you born into freedom or are you born into slavery? And a couple of lawsuits had been filed from descendants of slaves that got their freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically got emancipation through the court. So um, in the early 1660s, the Virginia House of Burgesses passes a, a law or a doctrine it's called uh, partis sequitur ventrum. And it basically means that the status of the person descends through the mother. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if, if your mother was a slave, you too are, are slave. Uh, if your father was free and your mother was a slave, you're a slave. If your mother was free and your father was free, then you're free. Uh, I see. So the formula there. Yeah. And that's set into law. And what it does is it starts to racialize slavery as a separate category apart from indentures. I see. Uh, so you have a whole path trajectory that comes out of this. Okay. And then a century later... We're getting into the revolutionary era. It's already established under a matter of law, positive wow. law, that race and slavery are more closely uh, associated with each other because the descendants of the original slaves are descendants through the the, the mother's line or new imported slaves, the mother's uh, Interesting. line. Interesting. I didn't know that. And what about geography? Like, does that have something to do with it as well? I, I was one of yeah. the things that I had thought of, and this was without checking it. But a question that I had for you was, um, Canada was officially became a country in 1867. So that is, you know, a long time after you have uh, the the founding package, you know, exactly. Exactly. Um, So, or or the American Revolution, let's just say about 100 years later. So is it possible that a there was slavery going on in Canada that we didn't know about? Or is it just you know, yep. some people geographically were kept within the greater area of what's now the United States. Yeah, so, so there is slavery in Canada, but it's under ambiguous legal terms. Uh, it's not as if the legislature has, as the House of Burgesses in Virginia had done, uh, had come and very clearly codified it. Okay. Uh, and you have this also in the northern states. Uh, there are slaves in the northern states on the eve of the revolution, almost every single state. The only one that doesn't, it really isn't a state at all, is Vermont. It's created um, in 1777 yes. as the no man's land between Massachusetts, New York, and Canada claimed it. Right. And basically no one lived there except for a few frontier settlers, and they organized a constitution that from the start said slavery is banned. Yes, actually, this is what I, I was... Uh 
watching some stuff yesterday, and I learned this. So yeah, they've yeah. they kind of founded their own country, basically, you know, and, until and then 1791. They decided, okay, well, who are we going to associate <laughs> with? What's what's this, what's the line with the Americans? Yeah, but Massachusetts had slavery. New York had slavery. Uh, but the it's geography matters in the sense that most of the slaves in the northern states are either farm hands on a, fa- a small farm, okay, or they're domestic servants in the household. So Alexander Hamilton's wife's family was a very wealthy family out of New York State that had several slaves as servants in its household. The reason why I ask you is this, is because you have these two things that are unique to America, Mm -hmm. which is the ideas of the founding, which the American experiment is totally unique in that it's kind of based on the ideas of if we look in the economic sense, economic liberty, yeah. which would be associated yeah. more with free markets, what people call capitalism, right? Yeah. And then you also have um, a newer country uh, that is founded and that allows slavery to be part of that founding, in a sense. Yeah. So I think that that's what makes it so that people can criticize America so much and pair those two things together. Right. Like it's a way of saying, well, look at the Americans or look at the USA. This is what they do. They're capitalists. They're racists. And these things kind of just they're melt together. And, and right. everything that's associated with them is discredited now. Right. So what do you say to that? Well, I, I, it's a very tendentious way of looking at the past. It's uh, it's one that cherry picks the problems of the past, the acknowledged problems of the past, mm-hmm. elevates them to the entirety of the whole story. And Nicole Hannah Jones has been really bad about this because, uh, I mean, she has no room. So here's the oddity. Even the, the original version of the 1619 Project, it not only has no room for capitalism and the and the American founding and uh, the, the whole narrative of the American Revolution as a freedom story, which mm-hmm. is certainly there even with slavery as a, an intrusion on that. Uh, Nicole Hannah Jones is version of American history has no room for Frederick Douglass. Which is strange. Yeah. And, and it turns out because Frederick Douglass is actually a champion of American constitutionalism. Frederick Douglass denounces the socialists of his own day, uh, supports mm. the cause of free trade, uh, gives a very famous speech in the 1850s where uh, uh, he embraces the principles of the 4th of July and says, properly understood, these documents are anti-slavery documents. Hmm. Interesting. And, and that's that's like almost nowhere to be found in the 1619 Project, although she has kind of come back after the fact when people pointed out, well, where's Frederick Douglass, yeah. the most prominent black abolitionist in this era, and he's not even part of your story. And she's right. kind of like tried to retrofit a fabricated version of him into uh, into the new uh, narrative that she's telling. But it, it's it's... The same thing throughout the 1619 Project. My my own belief, and I've got some evidence of this from my interactions with Nicole Hannah Jones, and those are a fun story, mm-hmm. um, that she wrote a narrative without doing the research. She had a political narrative crafted on how she wanted to tell American history, mm-hmm. and she had bits and pieces, but it came from really peripheral sources. Uh, there is a, 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 a black radical strain of American historiography, uh, tied to Lerone Bennett, who was a uh, an author that wrote a book in the in the uh, the nineteen sixties, basically arguing something fairly similar to the sixteen nineteen project, though that's much more nuanced uh, than her. Uh, so I, I sometimes refer to her narrative as garbled Lerone Bennett. And then what she did is uh, rather than actually doing deep research to figure out if the claims hold up uh, or adding the appropriate nuances and caveats and some of the more controversial claims, like what she says about the American Revolution. Uh, she went full speed ahead with like a, uh, an unvarnished version of this very simplistic narrative of American history. And then, very obvious reasons, it gets attacked because it has factual flaws. It was attacked even before it went into print, we later found out. Uh, Leslie Harris, who is a historian of the American Revolution, had been asked by the New York Times to fact-check this claim about the revolution being a pro-slavery movement. Mm -hmm. And she tells the newspaper, don't run this. This is not factually accurate. Wow. Uh, A very distinguished historian. Right. um, And they basically ignored her. They go to print anyway, and she. This is one of the turning points in the 1619 debates. Is she uh, basically goes to Politico and reveals what had happened as Nicole Hannah Jones is getting hammered over this factually inaccurate claim. 
So what did the New York Times do? Uh, you'd think that in that type of a scenario, that type of a very public embarrassment, they'd apologize, issue an appropriate correction, and say, let's put this behind us, let's move forward, let's correct the narrative, and we continue with the 1619 Project. Yes. And I think most historians would be, okay, this is a fair conversation to have. You're recognizing your error. You're, you're doing the right thing to properly credit the history that exists. Yeah. But Nicole, so they make one slight adjustment to it, but Nicole Hannah-Jones just basically doubles and triples down. And instead of changing course on a clear error in her narrative, she starts cherry-picking secondary sources in bits and pieces, sometimes even misrepresenting the secondary sources to prop up her claim. So it's like someone who writes the term paper first, finds out it's an error, and then goes on Wikipedia <laughs> to... to use half-truths right. to, to make the error look like it's less bad. Right, right. But but the thing is, is that Hannah Nicole Jones, she's still at it. Um, she's coming out with this series on mm -hmm. Hulu about the 1619 Project. And uh, what I wonder is, will this have some traction? You know, because part of the idea of the 1619 Project was as well to get this into schools. Absolutely. So that a whole new generation of children believe that America is fundamentally racist um, and that basically like free market systems are bad. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so here's where I really fault the New York Times. I think this is journalistic misconduct and malpractice. And there are specific instances of this where they've ghost edited passages out of the 1619 Project. Oh. But they set this project up knowing it was going to be the basis of a school curriculum. Right. And yet the way they present it to the public, whenever that's criticized, when they said, this is deficient scholarship, they said, well, it's actually an act of journalism. We're engaged in creative licenses. So it, it's scholarship when they want to use it in the classroom, but it's journalism when they need that to use as cover for clear problems that would right. make it uh, an issue to, to base a curriculum on the classroom. Huh. So they want it both ways. And they pivot back and forth between this by never committing to whether it's history or journalism. It's journalism when it needs to be journalism. It's history when it's convenient to be history. And and really, it's kind of selling the public a bill of goods about what this whole thing is about. Uh, and at the end, what you find out what it's really about is the political narrative. Yes. It's not the history. It's not correcting something that's been neglected in the classrooms. Uh, I mean, American history classrooms have plenty of problems in their past. Yeah. Uh, the textbook wars have been a problem of politics for centuries. Uh, but this is, a, this is just a new foray into it that they are playing political mechanisms and tools in a way to advance a narrative and what what becomes expendable is is an actual detailed nuanced historical investigation right. of slavery. If that was the goal, then that could have been a, another another thing entirely. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So I know that we're running out of time, Phil, and I would love to speak to you so much more about this. There's a lot more ground to cover. Uh, I recommend the 1619 Project, a critique by Phil Magnus here with us. Any last thoughts? Uh, the main thing I would say is go to the original sources. I would urge anyone that's listening to this or anyone that watches the Hulu series in the 1619 Project, investigate and interrogate the sources that they claim because oftentimes what's being presented as fact or being presented as true is not so. Uh, and in fact, you, you have the same issue you run into with the, the fact-checking industry. It's people that are out of their league, that are unqualified to even make several of these claims, are being put forth as authoritative experts, and what's shoved aside is deep, careful, substantive, scholarly investigation of a very real problem of American slavery. Thank you so much, Bill. Right, thanks. Mm -hmm.